All right, so we have three times the fourth root of b to the seventh plus 2b times the fourth root of b to the third. So I cannot add these terms in their current state. Um, if you're gonna add terms, what the index of the radical has to be the same, what's under the radical, the radican has to be the same. And then if you have variables on the outside of your radical, those have to be the same as well. So notice that uh, we don't have B on the outside in both cases. We don't have the same thing under the radical in each case, but we do have the same index. So at least we start there. Um, so we have to simplify this as much as possible or see if it's possible to simplify this in order for us to create a scenario in which we will be able to add these terms. So now what I recognize is this can be simplified because I can break up that, four, uh, that B to the seventh power in this fashion because it's all about what can your index divide into when you look at the powers of your uh, exponents, I mean the powers of your variables. So if I can break that b to the seventh or that seventh number down, uh, let me say it like this. If there's a multiple of four that is less than the number of this power, then I can break it down further. So in other words, I can break that down into four and three, b to the fourth and b to the third power. 4 plus 3 is 7. And the rationale is, let's say if I had the fourth root of b to the 20th power. Well, what's going on here is that that is the same thing as b to the 20th power raised to the 1 fourth power. And that, all that means is I'm going to divide that 20 by 4, and that's b to the fifth. So this is what we're leaning on, this process right here. Now, of course, seven isn't divisible by four, but four is. So let's say if I have uh, the fourth root of b to the 22nd power, right? We just saw that we could do 20. So I could really break this up into the fourth root of b to the 20th times b to the second. 20 plus two is still 22, but now I can take the fourth root of them individually. We just saw that b to the, uh, the fourth root of b to the 20th power is b to the fifth. And then I will leave this one under the radical. And this will be the most simplified way of expressing this right here. So you want to choose the highest multiple of the index of your radical that is under this number right here. So that's why I broke it up into four and three. So I can take the fourth root of b to the fourth and leave the b to the third under the radical. Four divided by four is one, so that's b, and then fourth root of b cubed. So that's what that simplifies to. So before we go any further with this problem, any questions on any of the examples, how we broke that down? Everybody good to go? All right, so now that's going to be 3b, fourth root of b cubed, plus 2b, fourth root of b cubed. I believe that's what it was over there with the two, yep. And so now I can add them together. I have my b on the outside. I have my index, that's the same. And I have b to the cubed, or b cubed, not b to the cubed, but b cubed under the radical, which is the same. So you need all three of those pieces to be the same in order to be able to add them together. And now that's going to be 5B, fourth root of B cubed as the answer. All right. Hmm. Mr. Coley, questions before... Uh... I know that was your question, so make sure you're good with that before we go any further. Uh, I just watched it again if I get lost. Basically, you have to break down what's inside the radican. Mm-hmm. Yep. So they can look alike. Yep. And if you cannot make them look alike, then you can't add them together. Just like, like terms. You know, just basically, are you talking about like terms? Are they like terms? All right. Thank you, Professor. 
not a problem. And we were supposed to meet yesterday, but we missed each other. Um, well, I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you offline. I'll talk to you offline. All right, cool. So let's look at 9.3. That should be a three. Doing that for my own notes. Got square root property. And completing the square. So looking at the square root property says if x is equal uh, x squared is equal to k then x is equal to plus or minus square root of k all right so why does this occur if I'm trying to solve for x and I have x squared is equal to 25, I want all of the values for x that will make this a true statement. So what values times itself twice will give me 25? Well, the answer is five because of five times five, but also the answer is negative five because negative five times negative five will also give you 25. So to give an account, for both of those scenarios, when I go to solve, whenever I take the square root of both sides, on the side that uh, that square root didn't cancel out, we'll put it like this. No, nah, I'll leave it at that, never mind. You guys are not gonna see that scenario. On the side that the square root didn't cancel out, there should be plus or minus. And then from there, apply your root. So plus or minus square root of 25 is going to be plus or minus 5. So that gives an account for the positive 5 and the negative 5. All right. Questions on that before we uh, do a few more to apply the, uh, that process. So whenever you take the square root of both sides, plus or minus has to be involved. Square root property. All right, so let's see. All right, here I have x minus five squared equal to nine, I'm squaring the quantity. So, I'll write it over. Take the square root of both sides in order to get rid of that square. Square, square root cancel on the left, leaving you with x minus five, then on the right I have plus or minus square root of nine. So if I add five to both sides, because I'm still trying to solve for X. That'll be X equal to five plus or minus square root of nine, which is three. Now they are expecting you, if possible, since I can't add and subtract five from three, or three from five, I am expected to do that. So that's five plus three here. 5 minus 3 here, 5 plus 3 is 8, 5 minus 3 is 2. Professor. Yes, sir. You cancel that 5, why? You're trying to solve for x, trying to get x by itself. So we had this right here, but I still need to get x by itself. There's a three over there, right? What's the square root of the nine? Uh-huh. 
So now that square root of nine is this three right here. Is that answering your question? I see, I see. Okay, okay. Just making sure we do it. I see. Thanks. Yep, not a problem. All right, let's look at another scenario. Let's see if I have x plus seven squared. Uh, don't write down that yet. I just want to make sure, I'm trying to figure out what I want to write. Um, and, yeah, let's go uh, 12. Okay. So here we have x plus seven squared minus eight equal to 12. So before you do the square root property, you do need to isolate what's being squared. You know, this is what's being squared. So we want to isolate that. So we need to add eight to both sides. So this is x plus seven squared equal to 20. Now we can take the square root of both sides. All right, so we cancel. X plus seven equal to, don't forget, plus or minus square root of 20. All right. We can reduce this, break down the square root of 20 into, because you know you cannot take the square root of 20 evenly. It's not a perfect square, but I can break it up into four times five, take the square root of four, which is two, so that'd be two square root of five. Let's see how far I wanna go. So now I'm looking at x plus seven plus or minus, that's equal to plus or minus. Two square root of five. Now that part you could have done at the end. I just went ahead and did it right there. As long as you do it at some point. Now to finish isolating or solving for our variable, we subtract seven. So that's negative seven plus or minus two. I don't need more room. Negative seven plus or minus two square root of five. Now this one is okay to leave like this because you cannot add or subtract um, two square root of five from seven evenly. So you can leave it like that. Go back to that last one. 5 plus 3, 5 minus 3 could be done evenly with no problem. Here you can uh, do that with the square root of 5 attached to that too. So leave your answer like this is fine. Now depending on, I think Connect Map give you the option to use the plus or minus symbol. But if not, you always can write your answer as negative 7 plus 2 square root of 5 and negative 7 minus 2 square root of 5. So that's the same thing. All right, questions on that. All right, one more scenario. Let's
All right. So here we have x plus 6 squared plus 19 equal to 3. So same thought process. We want to get x by itself. We need access to x, but we can't get to the x until we get rid of that square. We can't get to the square until we first get rid of the 19. So we'll subtract 19 on both sides. That's x plus 6 squared equal to negative 16. So now we can take the square of both sides, square root, excuse me, of both sides. It's going to cancel out these, leave me with x plus 6 on the left. And then on the right, plus or minus square root of negative 16. Don't forget whenever you take the square root of a negative, that's going to give you imaginary. Let me see, did we actually talk about imaginary? Because they talked about it in this section. I know we talked about it not being real. Anyway, whenever you take the square root of a negative, if you have it, let's say if I had the square root of negative 4, you know, that's going to be square root of 4, which is 2. But the square root under the, uh, the negative under the radical is I. Because I saw it in this section, but I don't remember us talking about it. Anyway, they might have missed it. So whenever you have the negative under your radical, that's going to introduce an I. So here's the square root of negative 16. Square root of 16, we know is 4. But the negative under the radical is going to be I for imaginary. So it'll be 4I. So once again, I know for a fact we mentioned how it would not be real. Um, so I, I believe I saw I in there. So if the negative is under the radical, it will be I for imaginary. Subtract 6. X is equal to negative 6 plus or minus 4i. And since one part is imaginary, the other part is not. That's as far as we can go, just like with the last problem. Can't add those terms together or subtract them from each other. All right. Questions on anything? All right. Um, the other thing in this section, completing the square. All right. So first, let me do this.
All right, so let's look at the first three steps. Completing the square, we look at a squared, ax squared plus bx plus c. So when I'm talking about a, b, and c, a is the number that's sitting, the coefficient of x squared, b is the coefficient of x, and then c is your constant. So when I reference a, b, and c, that's what I'm looking at. Whatever's sitting in front of x squared is a, whatever's sitting in front of x is b, and then the number that does not uh, or is not associated with x is your c. So the first thing we would do is isolate c to one side of the equation. So if you need to add, add it to both sides or subtract it from both sides to get it to one side of the equation, you do that. Uh, second step, if a is not equal to one, you divide each term by a. So if it is equal to one, then you wouldn't do anything for step two. And then step three, you want to take half of the b term and then square it. After that, you add that result to both sides of the equation. And we're going to talk about what all of these mean in a second. Four. All right, so the next three steps, factor using, uh, factor the perfect square trinomial, simplify the other side of the equation. Step five is solve using the square root property. And then step six is to check. And last step of all your processes is to check. Make sure you got legit answers. All right, give you guys a chance to finish copying and then we'll try one. Let's try it out. All right, so maybe we will pause. Okay. All right, so let's look at two M squared minus ten M minus 12 equal to zero. We're gonna follow these steps. So the first step is to isolate C to one side of your equation. Now if C, if your constant, let's say if this was the problem, your constant is already on one side of the equation, so you wouldn't have to do step one. Uh, all right, so that's not the case, so let's go ahead and do it. So we'll add 12 to both sides of the equation. 2m squared minus 10m. I don't know why I went down there. 10m is equal to 12. So that's the end of step one. I'm going to isolate the constant to one side of the equation. Step two, A 
a is equal to two. So that means we need to divide each term by that. That would be m squared minus 5m equal to 6. Uh, they didn't give us the easy one the first one. I must have skipped one, but that's all right. So now the second one is to take your B term or your B coefficient, which is five. Want to take half of that and square it. And I must have skipped the easier one because normally they don't give us one with fractions initially. Must have missed that first one, but it's all good. So one half of uh, five is just five over two. Now square that, that's 25 over four. Now hold on, let me see something. Yeah, okay. Now you add that to both sides of your equation. And like I said, they all don't involve fractions. Um, I must have skipped a few because I went trying to find problems. I must have skipped a few that didn't have fractions involved. Normally they hit us with ones that are easily divisible and we have solid numbers, but you know, you'll see one eventually. So might as well see it now, it'll be all right. All right, so now, Four tells us to factor the trinomial and then simplify what's on the right. So now if you're ever having trouble with factoring our variables m and whatever, let's see, did I leave off something? Oh, I left off my negative right here. It was negative five. And so I should have had a negative right here. So that was my fault. All right, so it should be half of negative five, and that'll be negative five over two. But squaring negative five over two still give you 25 over four. But the reason why I did that is because whatever half your B term is, is what's gonna go here with your factorization. So that's M minus five over two squared. And then as far as this is concerned, you have to do our you know, our factoring skills, not factoring, but fraction skills. Can't lose those, six over one plus 25 over four. If I'm going to uh, add those fractions, I need a common denominator. So that's four times four. I mean, four over four, which will give me 24 over four. It's 25 over four, which will be 49 over four. So we have M minus five over two squared equal to 49 over four. And that's the end of step four. So before we go any further, is everybody okay with how we got to step five? Just gotta follow the steps. Once again, if you have trouble factoring, whatever half your B term is, is what goes right here in your factorization with your variable. So now I can use the square root property to solve. I'll take the square root of both sides. That cancels out here, leaving me with just m minus 5 over 2. On the right, don't forget, whenever you take the square root of both sides, plus or minus. 
Square root of 49 is seven. Square root of four is two. Now to finish it off, I can add five over two to both sides. So m is equal to five over two plus or minus seven over two. All right, so five over two plus seven over two is 12 over two, which is six. And then five over two minus seven over two is negative two over two, which is negative one. So those would be your two answers. All right, questions. So we'll go to the next one. Here we have y squared plus 8y plus 15 equal to 0. So first thing we want to do is isolate our constant. By subtracting 15. And to step 1. All right, so we have y squared plus 8y equal to negative 15. Since a is equal to 1, step 2 isn't necessary. So remember, step 2 is only implemented if a is not equal to 1. All right, step 3. b is equal to 8. So you're going to take half of 8 and then square it. So half of 8 is 4 and then 4 squared is 16. Add it to both sides and that's the end of step 3. Any questions? Factor the trinomial, that's going to be y plus 4 squared. Don't forget, this is what goes right here. It's a variable and whatever half your b term was. And negative 15 plus 16 is 1. Now we can solve. Square root of both sides. I mean, y plus 4 equal to plus or minus 1. Square root of 1. What? Square root of 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So now I subtract 4. It's 
So that's y equal to negative four plus or minus one. And we can get an answer for that. That's negative four plus one. Negative four minus one. That's negative three. Negative five. All right, questions on the process. All right, everybody good. So that is what nine three is, those, those two types of problems. Remember the first one actually is a part of the process of the second. So that's why we most definitely had to go through it. So as always, try it out. See if you have any problems with it. We can go over some more. Um, before we close out, Mr. Coley, did you have some more problems you want to talk about? Um, no, you just don't more on me. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. <laughs> hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> so pleasure out of this stuff. <laughs> so, math instructor, you like inflict, inflicting pain. No, man, no. There's, hey, hey, man, I, I just try to bring joy to the world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with that being said, don't forget the way that I process it is just that, you know, if we have to talk about it again, it's fine, but it's better to be talking about it for a second time than to be talking about it for the first time, you know, in two weeks. Like, if you come back two weeks and say, can we go over completely square again? I'm, I'm cool. I'm completely cool with that. But at least that would be the second time that we talk about it versus it being the first time that we talked about it. And so, um, yeah. So, as always, try to stuff out. Um, if you got stuck, get stuck on, on this or anything. Don't forget, if you uh, need an uh, outside assistance individual, attention to these problems, make sure you email me um, so we can set that up. Um, Mr. Cool let you know that, you know, I'll most definitely get with you if that's what you desire. Um, but yeah, that's, that's this section. Um, any questions before we close? I told you I would turn this. No, I'm all good. All right, cool, cool. What'd you say, Colin? You know they, they, nobody got no questions. They just got hit with it today. <laughs> <laughs> so yep yep so but uh, I'll try to hold true to what I said we're only going to do one section per day moving forward we only really have two more sections left as far as new material is concerned so uh, for us uh, wrong screen wrong screen so we have two more sections yep that's 9.4 and then 9.6. Really, we'll see how how how, how involved 9.6 is. Really, we can knock both of those out in one day. And then that way, from this point forward, all we will be doing is reviewing and just addressing questions. Um, because I know 9.4, if all that is is quadratic formula, I know that's a very short section. Um, so we really can do 9.96 in one day. And then, like I said, from this point forward just be answering questions. Uh, and you guys just bring your questions to class and we just go from there. Um, so yeah, we might do it like that. So I'll just have to see how much is in that 9.6. But outside of that, um, I'm done for today. Uh, you guys have a good one. Be safe. And I will see you on Thursday. Don't forget, next week, we got a free week. That's Thanksgiving break, all of next week. So, yep. I will, uh, you know, we can look forward to it, right? So, I'll see you guys on Thursday, looking to close out new material and move on, do our countdown. So, have a good one, everyone. Hey, Professor Tucker. All right. Yeah, oh, did you have a question? Um, hold on. I'm trying to figure out how to enlarge this. All right, let me go stop the recording. Oh, let's stop the machine.